Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1982 So Bad It's Good classic by Frank Henenlotter, and that is Basket Case. Uh, and I will say, on a personal note, I believe this was the very first So Bad It's Good film I ever saw. So I remember the first time watching it just being like, what, <laughs> what did I just see? You know, um, and then after that, I was oddly intrigued, and I... It, I was drawn back to the film, and I've been drawn back many times since. So uh, I forgot to grab uh, where I was watching it from. I actually have the Trilogy Blu-ray pack from Germany that I got from Diabolic DVD about a year ago, and it was the only one they had in stock, so I got really, really lucky. Um, but because of that, I do plan on doing all three of the Basket Case films reviewed. I might even put them out, you know, day after each other, uh, but... For the second one, I'll go ahead and show you the, the Blu-ray box set that I have. Anyway, like I said, written and directed by Frank Henenlotter, who did other films such as Brain Damage, Frankenhooker, Bad Biology, Herschel Gordon Lewis, The Godfather of Gore, which is a documentary, Chasing Banksy, another documentary, and Boiled Angels, The Trial of Mike Diana, another documentary. So obviously he did all his more creative stuff in the beginning of his career, and then he transitioned to more documentary stuff later. Uh, I do have reviews on my channel already for Brain Damage and for Bad Biology. Uh, like I said, I'm going to do the other two basket cases, and actually I will also be doing Frankenhooker quite soon, within the next month or so, so that'll be up there too. There is a playlist on my channel for the Hen and Lauder reviews, so you can check that out. Kevin Van Hentenrick uh, appears in all three of the films. He's the one who plays Dwayne Bradley, brother to the detached Siamese twin Belial. I guess people just know him as Belial, but I guess he has a last name because he's a living thing and it was his Siamese brother, so it's Belial Bradley. So I usually don't think of him in, think of him in those terms because you think of him more as a creature or a monster because of A, the way he looks, B, the way he acts, and C, the way he's been treated his entire life. Which, by the way, this film kind of, as I was watching it, made me wonder, what would have happened if Belial had been accepted? If he hadn't been uh, separated from Dwayne and they accepted them as one person or as two people conjoined, or if they separated him and kept him alive, but treated him somewhat normal, or gave him love to some degree. It would have been a different story, but then we wouldn't have had Bastic Case, so that would have been a problem. Anyway, uh, they had about a $35,000 budget in this film, and supposedly, from some of the tidbits I looked up, uh, Frank Henenlotter said that it, the scene in the film where Dwayne first gets to the, um, the motel where he ends up renting his room, he pulls out a wad of cash that the the, the um, guy at the register comments about, and, <clears throat> excuse me, apparently that was the actual budget for the film. Like, all that money that he pulls out on screen was the money that they used for the budget of the film, so that's crazy. Now, that, thing said, that said, $35,000, in my opinion, even back in the 80s, <clears throat> for what they were able to do in this film, especially with the gore and the practical effects. Uh, I think that Heinen Lauder did an excellent job kind of stretching that money and getting a, a lot of bang for the buck. One of the things I would really point to is with such a low budget for this film, I would have assumed that they would have just talked about the actual surgery and separation of Belial from Dwayne, but no, they actually show it and do a pretty solid job for being as you know low budget as it is. So I was very shocked by that knowing how low budget it was. Um, so, man, Henenlotter knows how to stretch his money. He wrote the film f uh, based on some inspiration that he gained from just walking around Times Square. He called... <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. He called uh, New York City at that point seedy, seedy, wonderful atmosphere. And I think that's, A, accurate at that time, and B, really comes through in the film, especially with how much of it he ends up showing, you know, when Dwayne's walking from, you know, point A to point B, or running nude down the street, which, by the way, that scene, they did not have a permit to shoot. Uh, they literally just had a van on the road, and Bradley was in it, and they had a heater going in there, and then they would just, like, when it seemed kind of clear, the coast is clear, he would jump out nude onto the street, go running, and they would film as much as they could, do a little bit of it, and then jump back into the van real quick and take off. 
Uh, so guerrilla style filmmaking at its best, you could say. Uh, Belial is a mix of a puppet on Hen and Lauder's hand at certain times, and you can tell when he's, you know, being manipulated as a puppet. And then there's some portions of stop motion, which I love stop motion animation. So the fact that there is stop motion in this is great, and I think potentially one of my favorite scenes in the entire film is the stop is a stop motion portion of Belial, the one where he's flipping out in the room because Dwayne is gone and he's just mad that he's alone and has nothing to do really because he broke the television that Dwayne got him. Uh, but that whole like freak out scene is potentially my favorite. It's great. And the stop motion looks good for this being such a crappy low budget film. So yeah. A lot of the end credits apparently for this are fake names because they had a very small cast and crew and they didn't want it to just be the same people's names over and over. So for fun, they basically made up names so the credits look more impressive than it actually was. Uh, in the beginning of this film, the shot of the shadow cutting the phone line looks amazing. The first part when Lift later, I think is is the the doctor's name, the first guy to get killed, but you don't see who's doing it. Uh, there's a like a phone line that gets cut outside of his house because it's dark out, but there's some light. But it's the it's the shadow of Dwayne at that point, and you just see the shadow put its hand up, and then it gets clipped. That shot looks really cool, and it's a cool way to start it. It looks menacing. It looks, you know, it looks good. It looks great in my opinion. I love the Belial breathing noise that you end up getting when he's kind of on the hunt. Uh, in general, though, the noises that they have Belial make are wonderful because they're sinister sounding. They sound feral, which is important for making him more sinister and more um, dangerous. And then, like, the freakout moments where he's just like, ah, 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 like, it's distressing to a degree, too. So I just think that how Hen and Lauder design these sounds, all the sounds that Belial makes worked really well for him as a creature, I guess. I'm just going to say creature because he kind of is. The contrast of the clean cut Dwayne in a dirty city uh, that looking, you know, the look like New York City had is very mismatched. And obviously that's very early on, you know, when he first goes to the motel. Uh, it's just a cool kind of visual of like how he looks so out of place. And he really is very out of place because he is kind of a wholesome type person, except for the fact that he's on um, on a mission to help his brother go on a murderous rampage of all the people who separated them. So, yeah. You know, no point does he kill anyone, but he's an accomplice for sure. He, he didn't even drink. That's another thing. The other clean-cut aspect of him is that he didn't even drink. Like, he had never been drunk until the one drunken scene in the film with Casey in the bar, which is funny because the acting is insane. Like, Van Hentenrich's uh, acting, about, acting for being drunk, not so great, but hilarious in my opinion. The mystery of why Dwayne is there and what's in the basket is pretty engaging, at least early on in the film. And then he pulls out the blood splatter documents and your interest gets piqued even more. Like you understand then the opening scene he was involved with. Then you also start to question what is the point here? What are those documents? What is the significance it's going to make to the story? And where are we going from here? Especially someone who looks so clean cut as Dwayne and out of his element. The cuts are rough in this. They are very rough. When it goes from one shot to another shot... The, uh, the screen legitimately jumps real quick, so it hasn't held up that great. Obviously, it's very low budget, so it's a little hard to watch sometimes. Because of that, you have to be able to kind of block that out. If the guy who ends up stealing the basket early on when he was in the theater, when Dwayne was in the theater, if he could just kick that lock off of it, what was really the point of having the lock in the first place? That means it really wasn't working, and Belial, as strong as we see him being, probably could just push his way out of the basket, or someone could just break in easily by just, you know, pulling it off. Because the guy doesn't even kick hard. He just opens it up. But, you know. Uh, Dr. Needleman looks greasy. Uh, but that goes with kind of the whole feel of the film, because New York City in this looks kind of greasy. It's the seedy underbelly thing that I was talking about before. The first reveal of Belial is surprising, and the feral yelling he uh, when he attacks sells the savagery of Needleman's death. 
Now, the savagery in general with all the noises of Belial is sold like crazy with every time he attacks someone, all the kills, all the blood flying all over the place. And my favorite scene where he's just flipping out and tearing apart the motel room. In general, for being so low budget, the practical effects are not bad at all. And I would say that the design of Belial is pretty freaky. So good on that. I think my favorite scene... Oh, I already talked about that one. The reveal of the psychic link between Dwayne and Belial takes it to that kind of next level of weird. And they don't do it immediately. They kind of wait for it. It's a little bit alluded to when he initially tries to go to sleep in the hotel room that first night because he's, you know, kind of trying to ignore. He's arguing with Belial and you're not hearing anything as an audience member. But at that point, you think, oh, you know, maybe it's low budget. Maybe they just didn't, you know, put his voice in there or something. But then later on, you actually realize, oh, there is kind of like this psychic link. They can talk in each other's heads. So that is that it's that next level of weird. The visual of the toilet talk scene, when Bilal comes out of the toilet because he was hiding in there from people, and then Dwayne and he and Dwayne are having like a serious conversation, A, it's like an iconic scene for this movie, and B, it's hilarious, and I love the visual of it. It's so great. Uh, but this is the first time when they're talking there that you start to actually get a feeling that Dwayne is not liking his position in their relationship. He's not out outwardly hating hating it but he is a bit frustrated by it because he's starting to feel really kind of hand, um, handcuffed by uh, his relationship with Belial and doing all these things for Belial and all the things that he realizes he's not able to go and do himself because Belial will have a freak out or be discovered or whatever or just be mad. Dwayne drunk is not convincing but it's hilarious and his laughing when he's talking to Casey in the bar that made me laugh. His laughter made me laugh because it's ridiculous, but I, I, I love it. Showing the separation surgery is awesome and impressive. Like I said, for how low budget it was, I could not believe they did that. But it's a great scene. And it's a great scene for the impact of the actual backstory of how Belial and Dwayne came to the point they are where they're on this kind of bloody revenge rampage. Um... The groundwork is laid for the final shocking scene because of the scene where Belial starts groping Casey. When he sneaks into Casey's bed in the motel and starts groping her breast, uh, that's the precursor to letting you know that the Belial is starting to have se or has sexual, at least, thoughts. You know, I don't even know if he has a penis. And in the end, with that shocking scene, I don't know. Like, was he actually having sex with her? Maybe I'll find out in the second one. I actually haven't seen the second one yet. So that'll be my first time. That'll be fun. But uh, you don't even know if he has a penis in, in, at the end of this movie. He could just be simulating sex because he's, you know, because Dwayne has thought about it before. Because he's seen it on TV at some point. Because he's seen people have sex. You know, it, just because he has these urges and he just has this, you know, instinct to make that gyration movement. Like, we don't know if he has a penis or not. I mean, when he's fl flipping out in the hotel, you don't see it. So I assume he doesn't even have one. So, just saying. The screaming and attack scenes end up being drawn out a little bit long. Now, some people might really like that because of the ridiculous aspect of it. It just kind of takes it even further over the top. But for me, I'd like it cut down just a little bit. Just saying. There is no worse cock block than a crazed Belial popping in on an intimate moment. I'm talking about when... I think it's Sharon, when Dwayne and Sharon are in the bedroom and they're starting to get a little bit physical maybe, and then Belial pops out of the basket and he starts just like screaming and yelling and getting crazy. Um, that's that's an awful cock-blocking moment, especially because usually in a normal situation, that woman is running away and she is not coming back. Now the weird thing is that Sharon reacts to it by, after Dwayne pushes her out of the room, banging and, and trying to get in and what's going on what's going on she saw belial a normal human being would get out and not question anything because she doesn't even really know Dwayne that well either so in reality she would be out no questions or anything just gone and he would never hear from her again but here she is trying to get back in and help the situation not a good idea although i th i guess at that point it wasn't really going to matter because no matter what, Belial was going to be coming for her in two ways. Anyway, 
So I'm guessing when Dwayne's asleep, Belial's actions come to him like they're kind of a dream. That's kind of how I would explain the end. That part where Belial's sneaking out at night. I don't know if it has anything to do with his eyes turning red, but that's a freaky, fun moment. But when Belial's trying to sneak out, you know, that's when uh, Dwayne is having that nightmare about running naked down the street. Now, I kind of viewed that as he he is aware then or he is getting some sort of like brain frequency of what Belial is doing where he is going but because he's asleep he's not getting it clearly that it's kind of being filtered through his subconscious instead of his conscious and it's coming through as some sort of dream so he's not 100% sure that it's real like he thinks he's just dreaming it but then obviously when he actually kills Sharon and he's having sex with her uh, that's when he wakes up because he knows something's really happened um, I already talked about the question of does Belial have a penis? And actually, put a comment down there. Do you think Belial has a penis? That's what I need to know. Uh, Belial grabbing Dwayne by the junk at the end was A, unexpected, B, funny. And the fact that also, it was, I mean, it was C, I guess I could say impressive because of how far he lifts him up. And that's another thing that I'm, you know, going back to something I said earlier, that's such a show of strength that by his crotch, he can just lift him that high up. That's why I'm saying that that lock on the on the basket would not hold him in there. Definitely not. Not with that type of strength. You do hear Belial's emotion change. This is a very interesting thing, I thought. You hear his emotion change at the end, going from like upset and rage-filled to sad and concerned when he's hanging out the window, holding on to Dwayne by his neck, and he's realizing that he is murdering, he is at that point, accidentally killing his own brother, the only one who's really cared for him other than the aunt that passed away, the only one who's really cared for him and has really done much to show him love at all in this world. So, and and all that after Belial betrayed him too. So it's a, it's a tough ending for this, uh, which, you know, it actually kind of feels a little bit like a version of a Frankenstein story, just saying. The acting is so awful in this, obviously, but that's one of the best things about this film. That is one of the things that keeps me coming back, is my ability to laugh at the acting. It's wonderful. Uh, I love it. Uh, the film is somewhat about the negative impact on a child from the abortion, kind of, of a twin brother. Now, this could be viewed as um, maybe having an, an actual abortion angle, but if you think about it, the fact that Belial is removed from Dwayne and then literally like thrown in the garbage like a dumpster baby on prom night. Yeah, it is kind of abortion-esque, like underground abortion-esque. So I don't know if that was an intentional thing or if that just kind of happened. Don't know. We don't know. We'd have to hear from Frank Hennett and Lauder on that one. So anyway, this obviously is one of the films I have to rate two ways. So I would say in the pantheon of all film, taking it seriously, out of five stars with half stars in play, you got to give it like a one and a half star, right? One and a half star. Now, on the scale of so bad it's good films, I'm going to give it a very, very solid, very good four star rating because it is up there. It's not the best awful so bad it's good movie, but it's it's a fun time. And I am very, very excited, as you may be able to tell, to get into Basket Case 2 and Basket Case 3, The Progeny. Because I've never seen either of those before, and I'm ready. I'm very ready. Anyway, give me your comments down there, your feelings on Basket Case, some of your favorite scenes, whatever you want to talk about. But do me a quick favor, hit that subscribe button. Uh, if you appreciate this video, appreciate any video I've ever done, that is your best way to repay me. It is very painless for you. Literally takes a second. But if you are going to do that, also hit the notification bell. That way you know every time that I'm putting up a new review or unboxing or doing a live stream. But, you know, all that said, I do I do appreciate you guys checking this out quite a bit. Uh, it keeps me going. The views keep me going, but the biggest thing is the sub subscribing. So really help me out there. But regardless, thanks for checking this out. Until next time. Keep it brutal.